welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, so this morning, uh, Dr. Bird, she's one of our interns, is going to present a case. So she's just wrapping up her time with us. She's done a phenomenal job. We're, we're really happy that she's in our program. Um, unfortunately for her, the, <laughs> the recurring nightmare that I still have and wake up from every few weeks of being on Medicine Rounds uh, is coming true for her this next week. So she's going to leave us for four months, and then she'll be back and um, be ready to go. <laughs> so she's going to present ocular manifestations of arthropod vector-borne disease. <coughs> Thanks, Trent. So this case was one that was seen in Continuity Clinic with Dr. Petty and Jim Bell. They're both not here today, but um, we'll get started. So the patient first came to ophthalmology from an ER consult. She is a 30-year-old female, and her chief complaint at the time were these spots in her superior temporal uh, field of vision in the right eye. She didn't in say that they were float floating. They stayed in the same place, moved with her vision, and were new. She hadn't had any flashes, hadn't had these symptoms before. Um, her HPI, so significant, was that she had just returned from a trip uh, to Bali. She had been there for two weeks. She had been home for about a week, and two days after returning home, developed these kind of nonspecific symptoms, fevers, night sweats, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, had severe headaches. She had this rash. It started as a red, a red papule with some, a slight dome shape on her arm, um, myalgias, arthralgias. She had right upper quadrant pain. Her primary care doctor in infectious disease had already seen her and worked her up, and she was found to have thrombocytopenia, elevated ALT, elevated a AST. Um, while she was there and talking to her about her exposures, she had gotten scratched by a dog, didn't bite her, but she thought it looked ill. It wasn't <coughs> acting aggressive. Uh, she wasn't really traveling in an area where she needed malaria prophylaxis, so she wasn't taking any. She had remembered getting four insect bites, but was, that was it. And then she did say she was involved in a native ceremony that w involved drinking some fresh water. I don't know the <laughs> details about that, though. Uh, <laughs> so her past medical history, she's really otherwise pretty healthy, has some anxiety, hyperlipidemia. Um, it, she's on citalopram, lives in Salt Lake City. Nothing, you know, she's pretty healthy, 30-year-old female. Uh, no past ocular history. So on her visual exam in the emergency room, uh, her vision, 2020, things looked pretty normal, normal pressure. And really the only abnormal finding at this time was uh, mild inflammation in the anterior chamber in both eyes. Hadn't had this before. Like I said, no systemic um, diseases that we were aware of. Fundus exam was normal, just some rare cell in the vitreous. And so at this time, infectious disease, as I mentioned, had already seen her and her primary care doctor, and their leading dif diagnosis was dengue. They uh, felt like her symptoms and her, uh, the area that she had traveled to would be most consistent with dengue. They had gotten a the antibodies for dengue IgM and IgG, and they had come back slightly elevated but inconclusive given the time frame, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the other diseases that were kind of on their differential um, are listed here as well, and they had started to get a kind of a fairly large lab workup to determine <coughs> what she had. But at this time, from the ophthalmology standpoint, um, Mild inflammation in the anterior chamber didn't seem very likely to be from dengue. Um, wanted to rule out some other uveitic entities. She was started on Predforte and uh, instructed to return to continuity clinic in about a week for follow-up. So sh when she returned, she was still having the same symptoms, these spots, non-moving, not floating, no flashes. She was still systemically ill, having fevers, night sweats, abdominal pain, all the GI symptoms. She, an infectious disease, everyone thought she had dengue. She basically said, 
I have basically been diagnosed with dengue. So no changes in kind of the leading diagnosis at that time. But when she uh, came back, she had a little bit of cell after being on Ped Forte. And then in her fundus exam, it was noted that she had these small, flat, white retinal lesions prominent in the mid-peripheral retina. And they were found in both eyes. So you can see a picture. And they're subtle, but you can, where's the pointer? And you can see here these kind of there's white, flat retinal lesions. Um, we got fundus autofluorescence and just showed some hypofluorescence in the corresponding areas. Again, it's very subtle, nothing too drastic on fundus exam. The other uh, eye also had the same white, small, flat, hypopigmented lesions in the periphery. So at this point, um, and, and then, sorry, and an OCT showed some thickening in the nerve fiber layer in the areas associated with retinal whitening. So in looking back at all of her workup thus far, she had gotten fairly large workup and things had all been negative. The two kind of remaining diagnoses are dengue and rickettsia typhi. Um, Dengue, IgM, IgG were slightly elevated. It's too soon for them to be significantly elevated in the course of dengue. So that's what I was saying. I infectious disease still thought that that was highly likely. Rickettsia typhi, they had gotten this um, lab a little bit later in their workup, so it's still pending. And it was also thought that since dengue could, uh, is in the flavivirus family, that it could the slight elevation could in indicate another flavivirus infection, such as West Nile uh, virus. From the ophthalmology standpoint, um, these white retinal lesions, we thought maybe they could be caught in wool spots. She had been thrombocytopenic and had fevers. Didn't really, you know, weren't, they weren't, like I said, very drastic findings. And given her history, birdshot retinochoroidopathy was less likely, but just something that could have been had she not had this extensive travel history and the bilateral presentation. So right now I'm going to go through kind of the differential of dengue, typhoid, and West Nile virus and talk about some ocular findings that have been discussed and kind of relate it back to our patient and see what we can come up with. So West Nile virus is a single-stranded RNA flavivirus. It's transmitted by mosquito. It has a wide distribution in Africa, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Uh, it's gotten some publicity recently for uh, arriving in the U.S. No one's really sure exactly how it got here. Um, they think uh, they found the, the same strain, I think, in Israel. But the first case in the U.S. was in 1999. The transmission cycle is from the host um, the hosts are birds, mosquitoes are the maintenance vectors, and so it's in the bird mosquito cycle until an mos infected mosquito uh, infects an incidental host. And they actually infect horses a lot, they're most common, and then humans. Once a human gets West Nile, they can do direct transmission from human to human. Lots of different modalities for this have been described blood transfusions, organ transplant, transplacental transmission. There was one case of conjunctival transmission. So systemic disease in West Nile virus, um, non-severe is very non-specific, fevers, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, arthralgias. The severe neurologic disease can be seen in elderly diabetics seem to be more at risk and can have encephalitis, meningitis, um, altered mental status. So systemic findings aren't really that helpful because they are nonspecific and similar to all these kind of viral uh, uh, diseases. So some of the ocular manifestations of West Nile virus that have been described are chorioretinitis, anterior uveitis, vasculitis, optic neuritis, not commonly, but and um, there's been cases of congenital chorioretinal scarring. So lots of these, what do you mean by congenital so if it's transmitted transplacentally, and then they'll have, 
what they think is from uh, it's West it's Nile. Like yeah, exactly. And most cases that are reported are, you know, single cases or a collection of cases. But I, there are a few um, larger studies, some kind of interesting to look at. So a group in Tunisia did a prospective study with 29 serologically confirmed West Nile cases with neurological symptoms, which could be anywhere from a headache to meningitis. Um, these patients didn't have ocular symptoms to be included in this study, which is an interesting difference in all these studies because they do find very different ocular findings based on symptoms, which isn't surprising. But the most kind of specific in common finding is this multifocal chorioretinitis. It was seen in 69% of the cases. Intraretinal hemorrhages are very common as well. Um, and here was just the list of other things that they found, but retinal disease or <laughs> retinal vascular disease, um, vascular leakage, a few cases of optic disc swelling. But in the 29 uh, cases, 20% didn't have findings. So you know, the majority did have some findings when you did a full exam. Another group that did a prospect, or sorry, excuse me, a retrospective case study on 14 eyes with patients who had ocular, known ocular involvement, so symptomatic, and that was, you know, they had presented with that. Again, these multifocal chorioretinal target lesions were most commonly seen in 85% of the cases. Um, it can present in many different ways, as we see. There's a huge range of cases that have been reported with various ocular findings. And of note, in these um, 14 eyes, 71% of them were diabetic. And throughout the literature, it, it does seem that diabetic patients are much more at risk for having complications from West Nile. Uh, this was an an another interesting study just in the inclusion criteria. 52 patients in uh, India in the Aravind uveitis clinic who presented with inflammation, they included them if they had a history of a preceding feeder, fever, and out of 52 of those patients, 37 of them, when they did the serologi uh, serology for West Nile, were positive for West Nile virus. And they described their first cases of neuroretinitis, and they saw retinal hemorrhages, arteritis, similar findings, but the new neuroretinitis hadn't been described before. So here's a um, fundus photo of some of the deep active chorioretinal lesions. And you can notice they're in this kind of linear uh, pattern. And then you see the inactive focal chorioretinitis. And on FA, when the lesions are inactive, they have the peripheral hyperfluorescence and central hypofluorescence. And they the cases that have been reported all have seem to have this lin linear distribution of the lesions appearing like they are spreading out um, or being uh, spread contigu contiguously along the nerve fiber layer. So looking at pathogenesis, how this is happening, not clearly understood. Patients who are getting infected have peripheral inoculation by the virus. Seems that they the virus replicates in the skin longer Hans dendritic cells that then migrate to lymph nodes, viremia occurs, and organ seeding. But how the virus gets to the CNS is unclear at this time. There's many ways that have been posited, and, um, but it does gain access. And then chorioretinitis is thought to be from direct cell damage by the virus, and then a secondary dam secondary damage from host inflammatory response to the virus. Um, and it's also thought that this, the presence of the West Nile virus induces a multifocal granulomatous chorioretinitis. And in the patients, they all seem to, once they're presenting, they have these findings. So it's early in the course of the disease that they seem to develop the chorioretinitis. And a lot of the times, by the time they were seen, they had the inactive lesions. The good news is that the ocular involvement was self-limited in most of the cases. If you have some of these complications, like this 
foveal scar, choroidal neovascularization. They, they're reported to have visual impairment, but for the most uh, for most cases, they do resolve um, on their own, and treatment for West Nile is supportive at, at this time, so um, patients do fairly well. All right. The next um, disease that we're going to talk about is dengue fever. This is another de uh, virus that's tr transmitted by mosquito. It's in the flavivirus family. This is a disease that's getting a lot of recognition currently, just the epidemics are increasing exponentially and mosquito control is becoming a large focus uh, for a lot of international health movements. Uh, so the mosquito transmits it from primates in this cycle, primate to primate through mosquito, and then mosquito will go to a human and once the human's infected, it's just human to human transmission via a mosquito vector, which, you know, demonstrates why when you have these epidemics, it's really important to have mosquito control, and the more mosquitoes, the more it can just spread. Um, symptoms for dengue, again, these kind of nonspecific fevers, headache, myalgias, arthralgias, some GI pain or GI symptoms, a rash. The most severe form of dengue would be dengue hemorrhagic fever syndrome. This occurs with increased capillary permeability and it can develop into dengue shock syndrome and can be really um, detrimental for the patients and have a high morbidity and mortality. The, our patient definitely didn't have dengue hemorrhagic fever syndrome but certainly did fit in these symptoms, nonspecific symptoms of a viral infection. Incubation, thir three to 14 days, again, that seemed reasonable with her presentation. Uh, the most common ocular symptoms that patients have described is an acute sudden decrease in vision, central scotoma, floaters, and usually the findings are bilateral and asymmetric. So looking at some of the larger studies that have done been done with dengue. There was a um, prospective study with 134 patients who had known dengue in East India and they were hospitalized. So they didn't necessarily have vision complaints, but out of actually none of them had vision complaints and 40% of them still had ocular findings. Um, subconjunctival hemorrhage and retinal hemorrhages were common in these patients, but it's important to keep in mind that this was a group selected without, or there was a group that didn't have ocular findings and is a little different when you look at cases that did have visual complaints. So this was 13, this is another uh, study retrospective with 13 cases and they did have retinal, or did have visual complaints and most commonly found in these 13 cases was macular edema, but they had saw macular hemorrhage, vasculitis, some cotton wool spots. So you can see here a picture of a patient with dengue and um, they, this patient presented with blurring of vision, had intraretinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, macular edema. So significant findings on fundus and bone. There's also been reported foveolitis related to dengue, not commonly, but you can see it in the left eye there the yellow lesion kind of surrounding the fovea and on OCT this would be thicken, thickening the retina and the RP around the fovea. Um, the pathogenesis for dengue is also unknown but there's a few theories in terms of the um, ocular manifestations. It's thought that the dengue virus uh, has this non-structural protein one and antibodies that we produce against it can cross-react with platelets and endothelial cells. The problem with this theory is that um, the antibodies for NS1 would stay around in your body much longer than the actual symptoms and the presentation of the disease is seen. So it's clearly a piece missing, but uh, the other 
thought is possible direct viral invasion, but the, when they've had gotten pathology samples, there's no signs of viral invasion and no signs that there had been or any changes related to it. So a lot is really unknown. They, they've shown that there's a lot of increase in cytokine production and inflammatory markers, but the actual pathway for why this is happening is not, uh, hasn't been elicited, or hasn't been shown yet. So the diagnosis of dengue um, is related to the time frame in which the patient presents. There's two stages. Stage one, the patient has fever vir and viremia and the NS1 antigen in the blood. And not unlike many other diseases, you can't detect the elevated IgM and IgG until a few weeks later when they're in stage two. And so in our patient, basically, they, she had been tested for IgM and IgG elevation for dengue, but she was in stage one of the disease, had, was acutely febrile with possible viremia if this is what she had. So she had needed to wait a few weeks to have the elevated IgM and IgG detected. Treatment for dengue, like these other viruses, is supportive, but again, it's a, a good prognosis for patients with ocular findings and um, the rare cases of patients who had optic neuritis and maculopathy were, uh, did have some permanent impairment, but for the most part, the lesions all resolved and the patients had normal vision after the course of the disease. All right. And the last um, group of diseases I'm gonna talk about are the rickettsias. The, this is a, the group is a, has a wide range of uh, various diseases, but they're small, aerobic, pleomorphic, gram-negative bacteria. They can be broken down into two groups, the spotted fever group, which we list, there's a lot of different varieties, but most um, well-known is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and then the typhus group. So there's epidemic typhus, marine typhus, and scrub typhus. So the, our patient um, was thought to possibly have marine typhus and endemic, so rickettsia typhi. Most of these diseases are transmitted by ticks. There's a few exceptions. Rickettsia typhi is one of those exceptions. Fleas transmit it. So fleas transmit it from, or will get infected from rats with rickets, or rickettsia typhi. They will, the fleas will then spread it to various hosts, and it can be a wide variety, humans, uh, cats, dogs, rats, and the cycle would continue. So humans are incidental hosts. The way that the fleas do infect people when they are um, biting uh, humans, they, or any animals, they actually uh, leave some feces, and so an open lesion that feces get in can infect oh, people. I know, it's pretty uh, <laughs> good for <laughs> early morning. So don't, <laughs> yeah, not a great way to get infected, but that's how the, uh, the transmission does occur. Epidemiology, it's very hard to find specific um, incidence rates because a lot of these are pretty nonspecific and it's thought that this is underdiagnosed, but it's in urban settings, coastal ports with lots of rats, makes sense. With uh, the increasing incidence of insecticides, it's been declining, but in other countries it is common. And uh, most cases from the U.S. have been reported in Texas, California, and Hawaii. And just as an example for how much it's probably underdiagnosed. They, there was a group in Texas that did, took about 500 children, and out of those 500 children, about 13% of them had positive IgM and IgG for rickettsia typhi. So, you know, that's just a small sampling of kids. It's like likely that many people have had this as a, just a nonspecific viral infection in the past, and it doesn't, you know, come to attention of healthcare providers. Systemic symptoms, pretty much the same as all the others, but headaches, high-grade fevers, rash, predominantly on the trunk, myalgias, arthralgias, some nausea and vomiting. 
And there's been, for the various rickettsio diseases, there's been a lot of different and a wide variety of ocular findings reported. And here's just a list of some of them. Um, but anything ranging from AION to endogenous um, endophthalmitis, that was only one case that I saw of endophthalmitis, but wide variety. The rickettsia typhi is mostly reported in the literature as single case <laughs> studies. Um, there was one group that I found that did, and this group in uh, Tunisia had, did a few of these vector-borne diseases um, studies, but they took nine patients prospectively looked at them, they had serologically confirmed cases and they underwent full examination. So out of the eight, or sorry, out of the nine patients, eight of them had ocular involvement related to marine typhus, so a high amount. And three had symptoms, five didn't have symptoms. Um, vitreous inflammation was present in about half of the eyes and these white retinal lesions were present in half of the eyes. Uh, the authors thought that the lesions they saw were from inner retinitis and versus uh, rickettsial duplication and deposition of immune complexes and inflammatory cells in the site of infection. Um, you know, the question again, again came up of if this is cotton wool spots versus another uh, mechanism, but the distribution that the authors saw, they thought were less likely to be cotton wool spots. They saw a few retinal hemorrhages and these um, s two eyes had optic disc swelling and one patient did have optic neuritis. So, you know, I think it just demonstrates you can really see a lot of different and wide variety of findings. But here's um, one of the patients that they reported and has these kind of small white retinal lesions flat, but not, you know, the most impressive um, and obvious. And here's another picture of the small white retinal lesions at the arrow. The similar lesions have been reported in a variety of the rickettsial diseases, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Queensland tick typhus, and then marine typhus. In this study, the findings were all self-limited and they disappeared with eight weeks. Um, the patients were treated with antibiotics, so you know they had gotten treatment. And rickettsia, you do treat with tetracyclines versus the other viral diseases where there's really no uh, specific therapy. So most of the patients had fever 10 days prior to their presentation when they were um, enrolled and found to have rickettsia typhi. <laughs> pathogenicity of rickettsia. The it's rickettsial uh, bacteria invade endothel endothelial cells. Once they invade the cells, they escape the phagosomes and can replicate in the host cytoplasm and kind of spread from there. They do specifically target endothelial cells and blood <coughs> vessels, um, destruct the adherence junctions between infected cells, and can increase microvascular permeability. So back to our patient, um, she had follow-up in three weeks and in that time her lab results did come back and she was positive for IgM and IgG, rickettsia typhi. She was started on her doxycycline course and when she came <coughs> back her symptoms had completely resolved. And her fundus photo had no, none of those white retinal lesions. They had completely resolved. So, you know, in her, it probably would have resolved without the treatment. Um, she was just systemically, you know, sick for a while, and infectious disease was late to actually even look for rickettsia typhi. But I think it's in the case just shows. Even here in Salt Lake City in, in Utah, there's still these kind of obscure other diseases that we can think about. But in looking at her fundus findings initially, these her findings were consistent with rickettsia typhi from the beginning and not dengue and not West Nile or the others, but there are reports in literature. So just another interesting one to keep in the back of our minds and it is in the U.S. Um, 
fairly prevalent, especially in coastal areas. And that is it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> That's gonna Which is similar to horses, yeah. They are interestingly near enough. Yeah. The species that particularly escape is pretty rare. Yeah. When you go for international travel in the West, you're not going to necessarily right. Right. And all of these are getting more looked at as their incidence is increasing, and we're seeing it around the world more. And people are looking for the serology markers, whereas before you you couldn't really look at them as well and you know, find these collections of patients as well to study. So we used to think of West Nile as being actually having a, a fairly high percentage of malignant lupal, but now we know it's somewhere very symptomatic. Exactly. It's probably, it's probably usually what we have. Right. So those who, who clearly have encephalitis, so yeah. this is what they get. Right, then the elderly diabetics, those have been the groups that it can be really devastating. Okay. <laughs> Watch out for <laughs> yeah. That's what it appears to be. Yeah, I think so. Huh? Right. Right. And they resolved completely when she had resolved retinal findings. Um, in the patients that they had reported with these white retinal lesions for the various rickettsial diseases, they have these kind of, they say sometimes scotoids or spots, but it seems to be that presentation and then resolution once their ocular findings are resolved. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, so th that was in our patient, the OCT findings. Um, I didn't, yeah, yeah the rickettsia typhi, yeah. And that was, you know, unclear from our perspective at first with, you know, cotton wool spots versus some, we didn't know exactly what infection was going on. And, um, but they have found these inner retinal lesions in the case reports of it. Yeah, it seems that FA was used in a little, at least from West Nile versus um, the um, rickettsia typhi. FA seemed to be more helpful in differentiating, but I OCT could be used because you wouldn't really expect to see any nerve fibrillae thickening. Yeah. It just was, at that time in the clinic, we just, I don't know, just one of those things we didn't do <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and Patients get that 
Her patient was still sick, so sti you know, and she wasn't, and she was convinced she had dengue and didn't, I don't know, she just wasn't really wanting to do that at that time, but probably would have been nice to have that information. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys. I'm excited to come back <laughs> in four months. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very excited.